Well, uh, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Jonathan, and take uh, the time you need. It's about uh, one hour or, or, or something like that. And yeah. uh, I, I need to tell you again that your research is uh, amazing, uh, and it's a great pleasure to have you here again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Show time. Okay. Yeah, and I just wanted to uh, thank Eduardo and Ivar for inviting me. Um, and um, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys think about this. So the what I'm going to talk about um, today is modal representations or representations of possibility and the the effect that morality has on some of those representations. So sort of, I think a good starting place is if you think about the kind of research that I've been interested in, so representations of possibility. Um, so that is like, so the, not the way that we represent the, the actual world or the way things actually occur, but the way that we represent um, the things that haven't occurred. So the infinity of things that haven't yet occurred or the infinity of things that aren't currently occurring or haven't occurred in the past. If you think about that kind of representation, I think a really important point is that it plays a huge role throughout cognition. So if you think about, say, the way we talk about possibility. So in natural language, we use these terms called uh, modal auxiliaries. So these are terms in English like can or may or must or might. And then we use those to talk about different possibilities. So we can say, you can go to the store, or he couldn't have done that, or and so on and so on. And so when we talk about possibilities, it seems like we have to be relying on some underlying psychological representation of possibilities. So that's one place where you might see representations of possibility playing a role. But there are other totally different ones as well. So take a judgment that some would say someone was forced to do something or that they acted freely. So part of the way that we make that judgment is to determine that it was possible for them to do something else, right? So you wouldn't say that someone was forced to do something if you think there were a bunch of, poss bunch of other possible options that they had. And so that kind of judgment too, even though it looks really different on its face from modality and natural language also has to rely on this underlying psychological representation of what's possible. Or take causal reasoning. So this judgment that A caused B, I think a lot of good work suggests that part of what we're doing when we're saying that A caused B is we're thinking about what would have happened if A hadn't occurred. Would B still have occurred in that case or not? Another place you can see representations of possibility playing a really direct role is in, the, in this recent sort of immersion of work on how kids think about possibility. So, you know, when you're just coming into life, how do you think about possibility? Do you just think that, say, everything is possible, um, no matter what, or do you think that only a very, very few things are possible, and how does that change across the course of development? Another place you can see this is in decision-making. So the normal way that decision-making studies work, right, is that you have, people are given a set of options. So say, like, you're trying to choose between restaurants, and you're given restaurant A or restaurant B. And then that work has been really good, but I think a really kind of fundamental thing that a lot of that work misses out on is this idea that that's not how we make decisions in the real world. In the real world, there are just too many restaurants to even consider. So part of what we have to do is, is narrow that set down to a much smaller set of the ones we, we're taking as serious possibilities. So even in sort of ordinary real world decision making, I think representations of possibility are going to play a really fundamental, important role. It's not really all that well studied. Um, and that's not true just of these five things, but a bunch of other things. So moral moral judgments are going to rely on representations of possibility. Predictions of others' actions are going to rely on other people on representations of possibility. Counterfactual thinking is going to rely on it, and so on and so on. And you can keep going on and on. It just the basic idea here is that representations of possibility play this really fundamental role um, throughout cognition. So what I want to talk about today is not what the role that it has in all across all of these things, but the role that it plays in five of these different areas. And so how should, if there really is this underlying psychological representation of possibility, um, how should we think about the role that it plays in cognition? So if you look at past work on this, mostly what people have studied is how people think about what's possible on reflection. So for instance, if you get people to just say, do behavioral tasks where they're just making judgments about what's possible. Or for instance, if they're if you're asking them explicitly to come up with counterfactual events, so things that could have happened, and then to evaluate what would have happened under those circumstances. Um, that's all really sort of deliberative reasoning. And the, if you look at the neuroscience work on this, is you see the same kind of patterns, right? So what you see is that people get people to engage in something like, um, you know, just deliberative sort of 
um, episodic simulation, so you're just like imagining a possible event that hasn't occurred, so a non-actual event. Or you could be imagining a sort of doing an episodic simulation of a counterfactual event and trying to figure out what would have occurred under those circumstances. And I think all of that work has been really good and important. Um, but I think it's fair to say that all of the, that work, that representation that they're studying, comes at the end of a lot of processing, right? It's, just, it's the result of a lot of really complicated underlying psychological processes. And so one possibility is that all of the, that's the representation that plays a role throughout things like modality and natural language, or judgments of force and freedom, or decision making. But I also think there's some reason to wonder whether or not that's going to be exactly right. I mean, it seems like we can do a lot of these things, say, to decide that someone didn't have to do something or that um, just make a decision without doing any of this kind of deliberate sort of effortful episodic simulation or um, sort of online reasoning about the possibilities we're considering. So it said it seems like maybe what a lot of these these sort of judgments that we care about or are relying on is a more default representation. So one that doesn't occur at the end of all this processing but sort of is there from the very beginning. So the default way that we would think about possibilities. So what I want to argue today um, is that there is this default representation of possibility. We do in fact have those. Um, and I'm going to argue that it has this kind of interesting signature. So it's going to be something, a representation of possibilities that's constrained by both descriptive facts, so just like which things are say, can physically happen in that given scenario, or which things um, are possible or uh, um, likely to happen. But also say what's good. So which things would actually, our prescriptive values are going to play some role in constraining the possibilities that we default to considering in a given circumstance. So that's going to be the first part of the argument. The next part of the argument is then I want to say that representation of possibility, the default representation of possibility, actually plays a role across all these different areas of cognition. So I think it plays a role in how we talk about possibility, and judgments of force, and causal judgments, and how little kids start life by thinking about possibilities, and even in decision making. And then the final thing that I want to do is sort of throughout the talk is I'm going to then say, well, if we can get a better picture of what the default representation of possibility is, then we can think about how that might relate to the actual thing we do when we talk of like how, the kind of semantics we would give for modality and natural language, or say like how we actually are making judgments of force or freedom, or how we're doing causal reasoning. So which which possibilities we're reasoning over or not when we're trying to decide something, cause something, tell us some, it might tell us something about development and possibility, and it's going to tell us something about decision making too. That's what I'm going to argue. Okay, so here we go. Where I want to start is just by arguing that there are default representations of possibility and that they're constrained not just by descriptive facts, like what's like, say, could physically occur, but also by prescriptive values, like what would actually be good to occur. And this is work um, that I've done both, I think, it's on a theoretical level with Josh Noob um, and some other people, and then on an empirical level, the primarily stuff we'll be talking about here is with Fiery Cushman. Okay, so one way that we've tried to start um, to get a sense of the default representation of possibility was just by asking people to make judgments about what's possible really, really quickly. So we got them doing speeded judgments about possibilities. So the way that this, that the basic idea or the sort of conception, conception behind that kind of study is that what you want is to not provide participants time to reason away from their default. So if you answer and make, a, make them answer really quickly, the only kind of representation they'll have time to rely on is the one that they already came to the table with. So this is the basic picture. Okay, so this here is how the study worked. Participants were told that they'd be reading um, a little short stories and then be making judgments about whether certain events were possible or impossible. Um, and then they were told to answer as quickly and accurately as they could, and they had about a second to respond to each of them. Okay, so here's an example of a vignette that uh, participants read. So Josh is on his way to the airport to catch a flight to a hunting safari in Africa. He leaves with plenty of time to make it there, but his car breaks down on the highway. Now Josh is sitting in his car near a busy intersection and knows he needs to get to the airport soon if he's going to catch his flight. Okay, so um, I'm just going to, so after you would read a vignette like that, you would be told, so given Josh's situation, please tell us whether it's possible or impossible for Josh to do the following things. And then I'm going to kind of go through them quickly as if, um, so you can get a sense for what it would be like to make these decisions. So do you think it's possible for Josh to levitate and fly to the airport, take public transportation, get a stranger to drive him, steal another person's car, hail a taxi at the intersection, convince the airport to delay the flight, or ride a guy to the airport? So, you know, you can get a sense that it goes pretty quickly, and, it's, and in some sense, 
there are going to be just a higher number of errors because you're going quickly. But the qu kind of the question we want to ask is, is there a systematic change, not just random errors, but is there a systematic change in which kinds of judgments that you make? So the other half of the participants, but they instead just had as much time as they wanted, and we only considered their responses if they took longer than a second and a half to respond. But once again, they were just told, you know, you're going to read a um, story and then be judging, make judgments about what's possible, and then they were asked to think carefully and, and respond as accurately as they could. Okay, so we didn't just have a random set of possibilities, we had a bunch, and they, we tried to get them to fall into different categories. So some of them were supposed to be completely ordinary. So these are things like, you know, asking a relative to pick you up or to hail a taxi at the intersection, to call a ride, um, to call a friend for a ride or to take public transportation. Some of them were meant to be statistically improbable. So things like, um, you know, see a friend who's passing by and get them to take you, or convincing the airport to delay the flight, or arranging for a private plane. Some of them were meant to be physically impossible, so to violate an intuitive law of physics. So something like riding a cat to the airport, or teleporting to the airport, or getting a new car by thinking. And then the two ones we were most interested in here were the morally wrong events. So these are things like, you know, um, sneaking onto public transportation, or stealing another person's car. And the ones that were supposed to be rationally incoherent, so not just moral value in this case, but sort of just a rational um, value for yourself. So the way that these normally work was that doing it, there were supposed to be cases where doing this particular action to solve the problem, would, the cost of that would outweigh the benefits you would get. So paying $1,000 for a ride to the airport or trying to run there in time, both of them, you wouldn't get much benefit out of it, and it would be extremely costly. Okay, and we didn't do that just in one scenario about, say, getting to the airport, but we did it in a bunch of different scenarios. So one was the airport one, but one was about a person whose um, wife was sick and needed medication. Another one was about a girl who left her homework at home by accident and needed to turn something in. Another person was someone who wanted to go to the gym during lunch but forgot her gym pass. It was a person who was managing a bakery and money was missing from the register. Um, and there was a person who was lost in the Canadian wilderness with a group of friends. And so the basic idea here, right, is that we don't really care about people's representations of possibility in one scenario, like possi possible ways of getting to the airport. We want to ask whether or not there are features across all of these really, really different scenarios that generalize, right? So is there something general about the way that you represent possibilities when you answer quickly or slowly across all these different kinds of scenarios? Okay, so I'm going to show you the results from that first study. So what what I'm doing is on the y-axis here, it's going to be the percentage of events that are judged to be impossible. So higher bars here are going to be more impossible. Um, and then we're going to break it apart for each different category. So for ordinary events, improbable events, and so on. And then the lighter bars are going to be participants' answers when, when they go really quickly, and the darker bars will be their answers when they're answering slowly. Okay, so if you look at the ordinary items, what you see is that there's not much of a difference. Overall, they're judged to be very possible. Um, and that's true whether or not people are answering quickly or slowly. For the improbable events, so these are just statistically improbable, they're overall judged to be more impossible. Um, perhaps that's not super surprising, but again, there's no statistically significant difference between the speeded and reflective judgments. If you look at the physically impossible events, what you see is overall they're judged to be much more impossible. Um, and if anything, people actually judge them to be more impossible after when they have a little bit of time to think. And that's probably because some of the events would take a second to realize why that would violate the law of physics. But the key thing that we were interested in is the immoral and the irrational events. And what you see in both of those cases is the opposite pattern. So in, with the immoral events, what you see is that participants were answering quickly. They were much more judged that it was impossible to, to do something, to do that action, the immoral action, than when they were there answering slowly. And a similar pattern you see for the irrational events, um, though it's, it's definitely weaker in that case. I think um, one important point um, is that it's going to be a little bit hard to just explain the, the, the pattern that we see here just by something like um, regression to the mean when you're answering more quickly or slowly. So you can take two um, groups of the different kinds of events, so say the improbable and immoral events, which on average um, are actually pretty similar. Like if you just average across all judgments, it's roughly equal the extent to which they're just being probable and possible. And then you can ask whether or not you get an interaction between them. So in the immoral events, prescriptive values play a role, and in the improbable events, even though they're sometimes judged to be impossible, prescriptive values don't play a role. What you see is that there is a significant interaction between the two groups. So what that means is it's going to be a little bit hard to just think about how we could explain away the, this kind of pattern by thinking, well, it's just when participants are answering quickly that they made more errors or something like that. 
Okay, so what I think that this first study helps to show is that the, that if you are get, have a begin to get a way of, of trying to understand participants' default representation of possibilities, what you see is that prescriptive values play a role in constraining that set of possibilities. It's, you know, descriptive facts about the world, like probability or physical possibility, also play a role, obviously. But it, what's the unique signature here is that prescriptive values play a role. And then if you have enough time to process, what you see is that you can have a separate representation of what's sort of valuable in reflection or just what would be good, all things considered, and then what's possible. And that can be really separate from what's valuable, right? And that's the kind of pattern that you see come out after, and when participants reflect before responding. So in that one study, the first what I did was I just asked people to make judgments about possibility. And I think that's a pretty straightforward way of trying to get an underlying representation of possibility. But that's really not the most common way that we talk about possibilities, right? So normally when we talk about possibilities, we use these terms modal auxiliaries, like I, which I mentioned in the beginning. So these are terms like could, so we can talk about what could happen, what may happen, what might happen, what should happen, or what ought to happen. And there, there are others as well, but these are the ones that I, that I focused on. So if you look at the work that linguists have done to try to understand what the meaning of these words is, what you see is that they kind of divide up sort of naturally into different categories. So some of them have a lot to do with which things would be good or rational to do. Um, some of them have a lot to do with, they're called circumstantial modals, but they have a lot to do with what's like typical or normal to occur in those circumstances. And then some of them have to do some, with something more like metaphysical or physical possibility, just like, you know, which things are prevented by laws from occurring or something like that. And if you take that kind of, the picture that's come from linguists working on just how people talk about possibility and often, it kind of maps on relatively nicely to the, the representation that we saw at the end of, of processing, right? The one where we can have a separate representation of what's viable and what's possible. So here's something I think what that would look like. So take modals like should or ought. It seems like they have a lot to do with which things would be good to occur. Um, they probably also have something to do with which things are, say, physically possible, right? Because it's a little bit a little bit weird to say that someone, say, should do something if it, if it wasn't physically possible for them to do that. Sometimes that principle is called a, you know, ought implies can. Um, and if, but then if you take, say, like modals like may or might or something that has to do with more just the ordinary course of events, then what you see is that those probably have something to do with both, right? It's both true that people do things that are, say, physically possible, but also typically people do things that are actually pretty good. But then these other possibilities, ones that seem to sometimes at least have to do more with, say, physical or metaphysical possibility, it seems like they primarily have to do with just a judgment about what's possible that's independent of value, right? Value doesn't really play much of a role in constraining those kinds of judgments. All right, so I think that picture is a nice way of uh, a sort of, I mean, it's a, a, it's a little bit loose, but I think it's a nice way of just sort of trying to map on what we think about psychological at the psychological level and the linguistic level and how those might meet up. But what I've been arguing is that we actually have this other kind of representation, right? This default representation possibility. And if all of these different modal terms are um, ways in which we talk about possibility, it seems like, especially if people had to answer quickly, all of them should be relying on this underlying default representation of possibility. Right? They should all have something in common, actually, with each other. So what I next want to do is try to ask whether or not that's right. So the way that I did that, um, was by going back to the kinds of vignettes that I s showed you a second ago, say like Josh going to the airport, but instead of asking people to make judgments about what's possible quickly or slowly, ask them to make judgments about, for instance, what people, what Josh could do in that scenario quickly or slowly. So they would answer, is it true or false that Josh could do something? Not just could, but also should, also ought, and might, and may. And I did that for all of the different um, events that we had in each scenario. Um, across all the different scenarios. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the data that we have now. So what we're going to have is 144 different events. They're going to have different features, like how wrong they are, how likely they are to occur, whether or not they violate physics. And for each of those events, we're going to have six different speeded judgments. So, right, so there'll be a, um, a group of participants that answer judgments about which, whether or not that thing could be done or should be done or ought to be done quickly. And then we'll have six different reflective judgments of that event as well. Right? So for each of the 144 different events, there's 12 different types of judgments that participants made about that kind of event. OK, so what's cool is I think we can then take the data and then think about it at that level. So at the level of each of the different events and sort of what was the average judgment of what was possible, whether or not that event was possible when you're answering quickly, or whether or not that event could be done when you're answering quickly, or might be done when you're answering quickly. 
And it, now I think we can ask the kind of question that I started out. So we, what we can say is take the speed of judgments about possibility. So all of what I proposed was that they were all going to rely on a default underlying default representation of possibility. But if that's right, then what that means is that for each of the events, all of these judgments should look kind of like one another, right? They're all drawn on the same underlying representation, so they're going to look like one another. Judgments of which things are possible are going to start looking like, a, at least a bit more like, judgments of which things ought to occur. And then on the other hand, if you think about the reflective judgments, um, those are going to draw, draw on different representations. So like, well, some that have a lot to do with value and not much to do with possibility, and some that have to do with possibility and not much to do with value. Which means that if you think about how similar all those different judgments will be, you actually see that the correlation in comparison is going to go down. So if this is right, then speed, if I'm right in this kind of proposal, then people's judgments, all of these different modal judgments when they're answering quickly should look like one another, but when they're answering slowly, they should really start to come apart. I think one thing that's nice about this kind of proposal is that it sets itself up against a really obvious alternative which is that take the speed of judgment, say, of what was possible. If you think what was going on was that participants were making kind of just more errors in that case, and they just happened to go one way to give me the pattern that I wanted, then what you should think is that's going to be true across all speeded judgments, right? So there'll be more error for judgments about possible, but also there'll be more judgments about which things could be done, or may be done, or might be done, or should be done, or ought to be done. And if that's right, so we're just independently increasing the error across all of these different judgments, then what, by definition, I mean, that what that suggests is that the correlation or the similarity between all these judgments is just going to go down. And then comparatively, if reflective judgments have smaller errors, then you'd expect, just in comparison, the reflective judgments would have a higher correlation with one another than the speeded judgments, because there's just less error. Okay, so now we, what we can do is ask which one of those two pictures is right. So the way that I'm going to do this is we're going to take each um, possible modal pair, so take like judgments of which things ought to occur and which things were possible, and then we're going to ask how similar were those to each other when people answered quickly and when they answered slowly. And so the higher the point is, um, the, the more similar they were to one another. So if you were at one, they were identical. If you were at zero, um, they just were not at all related to one another. So what you see, say for ought and possibility, is that when people are answering slowly, they're not that much like each other, they're at about 0.6, but when people are answering quickly, judgments of ought and judgments of which things are possible actually begin to look a lot like one another. What you find is that that pattern is true not just for ought and possibility, but for other modal pairs too, right? So might and possibility. And if you take every modal pair possible that's non-reflexive, and then you can ask across them, is that does that pattern hold? And the answer is yes, definitely. So overall, participants judgments, modal judgments, look a lot more like one another when, you're, when they're answering quickly than when they're answering slowly. And I think that provides some initial piece of evidence that something like this is right. When we're answer, answering any of these kind of modal questions really quickly, we have to rely on the similar common underlying default representation of what's possible. But when we answer slowly, these, these judgments start to look a lot slight, less like one another um, because we have time to draw on separate representations, one about which things would be good to occur and not much to do with what's possible, and one to do with what's possible but not much to do with that, what would be good. The other nice thing I think about setting up the data this way is that I think we can make a, a more specific prediction as well. So what we can think about is, well, what's really going to be driving the difference between the speeded and reflective judgments in terms of how similar they are? And if you look just at the descriptive facts of, of each scenario, that's actually going to be playing a kind of similar role across speeded and reflective judgments. In all cases, that's going to constrain the possibilities that we're considering. Where the difference is really going to come out between speeded and reflective judgments is, is in the role that prescriptive value plays. So the thought is, when you're answering quickly, all of these judgments, like even judgments about which things could occur, are going to have something to do with prescriptive value. Um, but on reflection, that's really just not going to be the case. So to ask whether or not this much more specific prediction was right, well, what we did was this. So we divided up the data, or the events that we were interested in, into ones where descriptive norms were relevant, but prescriptive norms weren't. So this would be like, say, a physical, uh, an event that violated a physical law, or just like was statistically unlikely. Um, that's, and that will be on the left-hand side. And then the prescriptive value events were ones like the immoral and the irrational events. And these were ones where we thought prescriptive values are actually going to play some role. And then we can now do the same kind of analysis that I was doing before. So what we can do is we can ask for each of these different modal pairs, how similar were they to one another? And the basic prediction is that for the descriptive events, the just where, where just the sort of physical facts of the scenario mattered, there isn't going to be a huge difference between 
how similar these judgments are when you answer them quickly or slowly, because those descriptive facts are always going to be playing a role in constraining the possibilities we consider. And that's exactly what you see. So there is a little bit of difference where speeded judgments are more similar than reflective judgments, but it's really not much of a difference. But now the key question is, do you see that, do you see the real difference between speeded and reflective judgments for the prescriptive value events, for the immoral and the rational events? And you see a huge difference here. So especially, I think, if you look at the, the very bottom kind of bars there, what you see is that, say, judgments about which things ought to occur and which things are possible or which things should occur um, and which things are possible, those on reflection look almost nothing like one another at all, right? But if you make people answer quickly, then what you see is that those events begin to look, or those judgments begin to look a lot like one another. When we say that something is possible, those are also the cases in which we think, think that thing ought to occur. Another way you can, you can think about these data or look at them is to focus on the immoral events specifically. So these are the cases where we saw the biggest difference in the, in the first study that I showed you. And now what I'm going to be plotting is, is called a correlation matrix or a confusion matrix. But the, the basic way that this um, is going to work is that um, you're going to each, it'll be, we can think about how similar each different possible thing is to each other. And then the, we'll have a little square which will indicate how similar they are. So if you see a square that's just extremely blue, that means they're very, very similar. If you saw a square that was red or white, that means these judgments weren't very similar to one another at all. So, so here's the pattern of data that you actually see. And the obvious, I think, sort of striking thing is that if you look at the top left, what you see is this big blue blob. And what that big blue blob means is that all of the speeded judgments, so speeded judgments at which things could occur, or were possible, or may, or should, or ought to occur, all are very, very similar when you're answering quickly. And then in contrast, the reflective judgments aren't really similar to one another. So this is the bottom right the bottom right uh, corner of the graph. They just don't look all that similar. But the other thing that I think is, is less obvious but is really neat that comes out of, of the, looking at the data this way is if you think, so what's the one reflective judgment that all the speeded judgments are like? And the, um, so there's the reflective judgments. And then this is, the, this is the one reflective judgment that all of the speeded judgments are a lot like, which is reflective judgments about which things ought to occur. That one actually correlates relatively well, or looks very similar to all of, all of the speeded judgments. Speeded judgments of which things could occur, might to occur, should occur, etc. cetera. Um, and what's, I think, you know, what's nice about that is it kind of gives you a little a hint about what's going on, or a sort of a little simple lesson about how to think about speeded judgments a possibility, which is that they're all kind of ought-like, right? reflective ought-like. Okay, so the picture that I've tried to argue for so far is, looks something like this. So all of the speeded judgments, whenever we talk about possibility, we're going to be drawing on a, sim a similar sort of underlying default representation of possibility that's constrained both by descriptive facts but also by prescriptive value. Um, and when we have enough time to reflect, we can separate those representations, so what was possible from what's good, and then we can reflect on language in a way that allows us to talk about which things are possible even though they wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be good if they actually occurred. So now I quickly just want to talk um, for a brief minute about well what that might tell us about modality in natural language. Um, so if you think about the standard approach that semanticists have taken to modality, so this is going back at least to Kratzer in 1981, um, what you see is it, it looks something like this, and it'll be a little technical, but the details here really aren't going to matter. I'll, I'll just I can give a very high level description of this. So. The way that you would determine um, the meaning of, say, a term like have to, so what, is that, what does that little lexical item mean, have to? And what you would do is you, well, you'd say you'd consider a set of possibilities, and now you're trying to quantify over them and ask, well, what, what properties do all of those possibilities have? And the key thing that Kratzer came up with that, um, you know, and I think that most people have followed her at this point, and doing is, is having two kind of key pieces. So one is a modal base, and you can think of the modal basis to sort of the set of descriptive facts that are going to constrain the possibilities we're considering. The other thing you're going to have is, a, is an ordering source. So this is a way of, of ranking the possibilities that are left. So you take all the facts that are consistent um, with the way that you think that situation is, and then you can rank which one of those would be good. So if we say, you know, you have to, you have to do this, what that means is in the best possibilities, the ones in which um, all the best things occur and are consistent with the, the situation, that um, those in all those possibilities you do this thing. That's kind of the, the, the semantics picture behind all this. 
Okay, but the key, the key high-level point about this is that what you see is that there are two separate things that are going on, right? You, you, have the, you begin by having this set of descriptive facts that aren't constrained by value in any way, and then you put an extra constraint of value on top of those. But that picture seems really at odds with what I've been showing, right? What I've been showing is that instead, you, the default way, the way we actually begin, is with a representation of possibility that really, is really constrained already by value. So we don't need to put extra constraints on that of value. That's sort of how we start. So with Angelica, I've been trying to work out a way of sketching a new approach where you can have basically, um, instead of having these two separate pieces, which do some of the work of, say, like descriptive norms and then do prescriptive norms, you can have um, a single default form of, of domain projection, um, which we call factual domain projection. And then, and then from, from that, um, the question is, so basically the key idea here, right, is that the puzzle now for us isn't to explain how is it that prescriptive values and descriptive facts constrain the possibilities we consider. It's like, how do we ever get away from that? And so now what we need to say is something like, well, well, there are different things that, that can be encoded in language which would tell you actually don't have the prescriptive constraint in this case, right? We need to think, we need a way of picking out the possibilities which are just strictly physically possible and it just you can start to ignore value at all. Um, so I think that's one kind of cool way of thinking about uh, the a future direction where if you start to, to get at the underlying psychological representation of modality, you can think about the work that I can do even in things like formal semantics. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip the rest of this semantic stuff um, and keep going. Okay, so the next thing that I want to talk about is judgments of force or freedom. And the basic idea here was that, okay, so we think that judgments of force or freedom have to do something with a representation of, of possibilities. And now what I want to argue is that the kind of representation they're drawing on, just like modal language was drawing on the default representation, judgments of force and freedom draw on the same default representation of possibility. Okay, so here's the way that, that this worked. Um, I, should, um, I should say that also there's just been uh, uh, some work that I've done and a bunch of other people have done as well that has really tried to show that judgments of force or freedom do rely on alternative possibilities. Um, and the same thing is true for causal reasoning. Right? There's, a, I think, a, ni a nice growing literature on causal reasoning which suggests it has to be rep um, considering sort of alternative possibilities and that those are really going to be the, the key way that we can make sense of why things like morality um, or probability influence causal judgments or judgments of force or freedom. But what I want to I do um, is, is really focus on this kind of question. So it could be the judgments of force or freedom are relying on the default representation, or it could be that they're relying on a, a more reflective representation of possibilities. And now I think there's a cool way to ask which one of those is right for both those, for both those kinds of judgments. So what we did was we went back to the same six scenarios that we had before. Um, and so say like Josh was on his way to the airport um, again. But in this case, the story continued. So um, now Josh calls his father, who lives a few states away, and he tells him about his problem, that his car is broken down. And so now, not really knowing how to help him, Josh's father makes a suggestion. So Josh, in this case, Josh's father says Josh could, and then Josh's father proposes um, a possibility. So Josh's father might say, well, you could hail a taxi at the intersection. Or Josh's father might say, well, you could take a taxi without paying. Or you could try to run there in time. Okay, so but then no matter which possibility Josh's father proposed, Josh just ignores that suggestion. And he decides to book the next available flight, even though it's quite expensive. And now the key question that the participants were asked in this case was, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Josh was forced to book the next available flight. Okay, so think about for a second what the prediction is. So we know that judgments of force have to do something have to do something to do with the possibilities, right? So to the extent that you think Josh was forced to book the next available flight, then that means you think it wasn't possible that Josh did something else instead. So if Josh's father proposes a given possibility, say like running to the airport in time, and you think that's just not possible, then to the extent you think it's really not possible that he do that, you're probably going to be more inclined to think that he was forced to book the next available flight. But in contrast, if Josh's father says, well, you could just call your relative for a ride, and you think of that as a real, a genuine possibility that really was possible, then you should think that Josh um, uh, wasn't forced to book the next available flight because he had a good alternative. So that's the kind of way you should think about judgments of force and possibility relating to one another at a general level. But now what's cool is we can ask, do judgments of force rely on this default representation of possibility? 
So what we can do is we can take here, I'm, I'm just showing you for each of the different given events, say in that scenario with Josh going to the airport, how people's judgments of forced when, jo when Josh's father, how forced was Josh was to book the next available flight when Josh's father proposed each, each one of these events. And then, so that's on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis is people's average speeded judgment of how possible it was for Josh to do that event. Right, so it so for instance, you might think, say, um, this event, say, take um, uh, sneaking onto public transportation. So this was an immoral event, which means that participants um, would have, when they're answering quickly, would have been more likely to say that that actually wasn't possible. And now, and and I think basically what the pattern that you're seeing here is also suggesting that when Josh's father proposes that. People don't treat that as a real possibility. People are also saying Josh was forced enough to book the next available well flight because they weren't treating sneaking onto public transportation as a real possibility. Um, and you, we can show that's true not just across this one scenario where Josh is going to the airport, but across each of the scenarios. You see the same kind of predicted relationship between force and, and default or speeded judgments about what's possible um, across all six of the scenarios. And there's a, a very, very, very significant relationship um, between, the, between the two of those. Okay, but the, the key thing here, um, this is basically what I've shown so far, um, is that default representations of hostility are related to judgments of force or freedom. But now we want to ask, are those better predictors than reflective judgments about what's possible, right? Because we also have those judgments. So each we had a group of participants that also, on reflection, tried to decide whether or not a given event was possible or impossible. Um, and so the way you can ask which of these is actually which one of these is actually supporting judgments of force or freedom um, or, or doing what we did basically is model comparison. So just to explain kind of roughly the method, you take, um, what we'll do is we're going to try to predict judgments of force or freedom. And we're going to start by predicting them with both reflective judgments about what's possible and default or speeded judgments about what's possible. So we're going to have both of those. And then what we're going to do is now selectively remove one of them and ask, do our predictions get a lot worse, yes or no? And what you see is that if you um, compare a model which has both to one that removes the default representation of possibility, your model gets a ton worse, which suggests there's some unique work being done by the default representation of possibility, right? If there's some, some part of judgments of force of freedom that are in, in sort of independently relying on this default representation of possibility. But then you can do the same thing for reflective judgments of so what's possible. And what, what I think what's cool is when you do that, what you find is that the model doesn't get any worse at all, right? There's no extra contribution of these reflective judgments about possibility um, above and beyond what the default representation already did, which seems to suggest that these judgments of force or freedom are relying on this much more implicit default way of representing possibilities. Not There's not all that influence by which we which things we might sort of reflectively judge to be possible. So you can also do, I won't go through the whole experiment, but you can do the exact same kind of experiment to ask which one, whether or not causal judgments are under or are supported by default representations of possibility or um, reflective judgments of, about what's possible. And what you see in this case is the exact same pattern. So default representations of possibility seem to be doing all of the relevant work, and reflective judgments about what's possible don't seem to be adding anything extra. OK, so I talked a little bit about the default representation of possibility, how it might play a role in modality and natural language, judgments of force or freedom, causal reasoning, and now I want to talk a little bit about what it might, how it might relate to the development of possibility. Um, and this is some work that I've done uh, with Paul Bloom uh, in grad school and also Andrew Stuhlman. So if you look at how little kids think about possibility, there's a nice um, a sort of growing literature on this topic. And basically what you see is, you know, I think the, the normal intuition is that um, little kids um, just think anything is possible, right? You just start off with this like incredibly imaginative way of thinking about the world. Um, and then as you get older, you realize, no, a lot of those things aren't actually possible. But all of the evidence suggests that's just exactly wrong. What's, what's right is that little kids start off with a very, very restricted understanding about what's possible. Um, they think tons of things aren't possible that adults do in fact think are possible. So a good example from Andrew Stuhlman's earlier work with Susan Carey was say like you um, you ask a little kid, you say, do you think this this is possible or impossible? You go home and you look underneath your bed and there's an alligator underneath your bed. And little kids will just strictly deny that that's possible at all. And as you get older, you realize, well, it's of course not going to happen and it's not 
likely that it would happen, but it is technically possible. There's no, no sort of law of physics or anything else that would prevent that from occurring. Um, so we wanted to ask whether or not that same kind, that the, the restricted understanding of possibility that kids begin life with is also constrained not just by things like probability or physics, um, but also by value, by, by what would be good to happen, so moral value in this case. So the way that this study worked is we brought in a group of four to seven year olds and then a separate group of adults. Um, and then we would read them stories. Uh, well, first we would train them on how to make judgments about possible or impossible, which things are possible or impossible by um, just having them like do, make judgments about clear physical violations in the lab. So you would be like, you know, do you think I could do this? I could just raise my hand and stretch it up long enough to reach the ceiling. And it was a very high ceiling and they would say that's impossible. And I'd say, do you think I could do this? Could I get a ladder and climb up the ladder and then touch the ceiling? And that would, in fact, be possible. And even the youngest children, so four-year-olds, we got, were very, very good at this uh, initial training phase. They just didn't have any trouble at all understanding the distinction between possible and impossible events. OK, so then what we would do is we'd read them new scenarios. And at the end of each new, new scenario, we'd propose an event. And we'd ask them, is this event possible or impossible? So some of them, as in the previous studies with adults, were ordinary. Some of them were just statistically improbable. Some of them were supposed to violate intuitive laws of physics, and then some of them were immoral. And so this graph will look really, really familiar in a way to you. What I'm going to do is for each of those different events, I'm going to plot the percentage of, of events that was that were judged to be impossible in that category, and then we can look say start with adults. So let's start there. Here's the pattern that adults show. So they all, overall ordinary events were judged to be totally possible, and probable events were judged to be slightly more impossible. Physically impossible events were judged to be very impossible, and immoral events, in this case, they're really, really simple kind of um, kid-like immoral events like lying to your mom or being mean to your brother, um, were totally judged to be possible. And this is obviously adults are reflecting before making these judgments. This wasn't a speeded task. Okay, but now what we can look at is how how this pattern differs as children are, get younger. So when you start off, what does the pattern look like? And what you see in this case is, is, is here. So I think the most important point here is to look at the immoral events, right? So what you see is this enormous decrease across time. So when you're when you are in, in how impossible immoral things are, right? So if you're four to five years old, you actually think that it's about as immoral to lie to, or about as impossible to lie to your mom as it is to turn your hat into a candy bar, right? I mean, and what I think one of the fascinating things about this study is that a lot of the immoral events we chose were things that we thought little kids will have already done, right? So these are four-year-olds, they've, they've seen and done a decent amount of stuff, and these are all like really, really boring moral violations. Being mean to a friend, taking a toy from another person, taking a shirt from a sibling, lying to your mom. Um, and despite that fact that they were ordinary in this way, little kids often judge them to be um, as impossible as physical violations. And then that quickly decreased over time. So again, I think, you know, especially with developmental data, a really important thing is to make sure that you couldn't just be explaining it by just having um, more errors as with younger kids than with adults. So I think there are two pieces of evidence that go against that. One is that you can take, again, take the improbable events as a comparison case, right? So this is a case where overall they're judged to be about, about as impossible. And then you can ask, do you get a difference between the two? So the immoral events are ones where value is going to matter, and the probable events there won't be value, and what you see is there is a significant inter interaction between the two. The other thing that I think is helpful is just to compare it to, to chance, right? So what you see is that for four and five-year-olds, they're actually judging that immoral events are impossible above chance, which is quite hard to explain to if it's just that they're making more mistakes or something like that. And the other thing that I think is really cool about doing these studies um, contemporaneously was that there's just a striking similarity between the pattern that you see with little kids um, and the pattern that you see when you make adults answer quickly. Right? It's, I mean, one way to think about what's going on there is that the representation that we have as little kids about possibility, that default, the sort of default way that we begin to think about it, actually persists in us as adults. We get, we, what we develop is a separate way of thinking about possibilities, ones that we, a, a way in which we can get rid of, of, of value altogether. But we don't lose that sort of childlike way of representing possibilities. And, it, and I think that's the representation that actually plays a really fundamental role throughout cognition. Um, the other thing that we did with little kids is, is uh, we tried 
kind of go beyond, again, just the term possible. So little kids, especially four and five-year-olds, aren't going to be super familiar with the term possible, and it's not clear exactly what they mean by, by possible. Um, Muhammad Ali once said, impossible is nothing. Um, and, he, and apparently he also said, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men, which is, I think illustrates this point. Um, okay, so what we want to do is instead of asking little kids to make a judgment about what's possible, we ask them to make a judgment about which things would take magic to occur. And the basic thought here is that there should be no confusion, there's no way to interpret the word magic as having something to do with which things should happen or shouldn't happen, right? I mean, magic has a lot to do with the physical events that occur in the world. And little kids are really, really familiar with which things will require magic and which things won't. There's been a nice little body of research on how they understand that. And I think by even three years old, they really clearly get that, um, that, that distinction. Okay, so instead, the base study worked almost basically the same way, but instead of asking children to make judgments about possibility, we asked them to make judgments about which things would take magic to happen. And here's the pattern of data that you see. So for six and seven year olds and adults, what you see is a pattern that it looks, shouldn't be surprising at all. So these are older kids and adults. Um, ordinary events take no magic. Improbable events, they take very little magic. Physically impossible events take a ton of magic. And immoral events really don't take much magic at all. Um, but if you look at the younger children, so in this case, three to five-year-olds, what you see is a really, really different pattern. And once again, I think the most striking thing to look at is, is, the, judge, is the immoral events. right? So what you see is that for, for three-year-olds, especially, the immoral events took magic just as much as the physically impossible events, right? So it, it took magic to lie to your mom about the, to the same extent that it took um, magic to make a ball disappear. So once again, I think a good comparison is to think, ask whether or not, you know, well, we want to make sure this couldn't just be explained by more errors when you're younger, um, and you get an interaction again between the immoral and the improbable events, which is good. And you can also compare it to chance again. What you see is that three-year-olds are significantly above chance in judging the immoral events will require magic to happen. Um, there are a bunch of future directions and open questions about about this as well. Um, looks like this is cut off, but one 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 obvious prediction is that if little kids really think that it's impossible or would require magic to do something immoral, then they shouldn't ever make predictions. That are sure should very rarely make predictions that people will actually do immoral things. So they should be biased in their predictions about what other people do, um, specifically in, in kind of not understanding that they're going to do something immoral. And that's exactly what we see. Um, we've, we've done this with little simple economic games like the dictator game and shown that um, at about the same age that little kids think it's impossible to do something immor immoral or selfish, they also will be biased against predicting other people will do something selfish when they have good evidence that they in fact will. Um, you can also ask whether or not children are surprised by immoral act or immoral events in the same way they're surprised by physical violations. And that's some work that um, I'm doing with Andrew Stuhlman right now and is ongoing. Um, and the other, I think, kind of fun thing to think about is that if really what's happening is that children are thinking that something that falls outside of the default representation of possibility is going to be impossible and immoral events fall outside of that and that's why they're impossible, then you should also, they also might make um, sort of a symmetric kind of error. So take a judgment about which things should be punished or not, you can ask so whether or not they make the reverse kind of inference. So take an action that, say, would be physically impossible, so that should also fall outside of the default representation of possibility. And now we should ask, should people be punished for that? And what you find is that, yeah, they, they do say that. So you should be, not only is it wrong to, to walk through walls, but um, you should be punished if you do it. Um, and that work came out last year in the Journal of Experimental Child Psychology, if you want to look at it. Okay, so the one last area that I want to talk kind of quickly about is the, the, the role that default representations of possibility might play in decision making. And this is work that's ongoing with a graduate student in the lab that I'm in now um, named Adam Morris and also with Fari Kushman, who's the PI of the lab that I'm in now. And I think kind of the, the background for thinking about this was we haven't really done, a, or I haven't really done a lot to explain why default representations of possibility would be constrained by value, like by which things are actually would be good to occur. And so one way I think to start making sense of this is to think about the role that representations of possibility play in decision making and just deciding what to do. So go back to the example of the car breaking down on the way to the airport. But now imagine that it's not someone else's car, it's your car, right? So you're in the, you're in the car and you need to figure out a way to get to the airport um, in time to make your flight. 
So what are you going to do? Well, one thing that you could start to do by doing is just trying to consider all possible actions. But that would be a really, really bad way of trying to get to the airport in time, right? So how, what are you going to, I mean, there's so many different possibilities. There are an infinite number of them. You would never even be able to make a decision about how to get to the airport if you were trying to evaluate all of them. Um, instead, you can only consider a subset of them, right? So and it's probably a relatively small subset. So how do we decide which possibilities to even consider in the first place? And the thought is, well, basic intuition is that one thing that would make a possibility um, one that's not worth considering is that it's never been good in, in, in the past, right? I mean, we don't care about all the technically possible things. What we care about is a good, finding a good solution to the problem we're facing, getting to the airport. And we're going to have some, and so the thought is the kind of subset of possibilities that we're going to consider, even in decision making, are ones that are going to be influenced by how good those have actually been in, in our own experience. So a sort of a slightly more formal but still very informal way of thinking about that would be that the probability that a given action is going to be part of the set of actions that we consider is going to be proportional to the previously experienced value of that action. So we want to ask whether or not we can find some evidence for this kind of picture. Um, and this is work that's it really is still ongoing. We're we're starting to write it up now, and I'd love to to hear your thoughts on it. But it's it's sort of a little bit more um, exactly where my mind's at at the moment. Okay, so here let me tell you a little bit how this works. So here's how the study worked. So we asked we had a sort of simple task, which was first this, we had this training phase in which participants were told to choose a word. So they would be given two words like this: basket and football. Um, and then what they would find out is that choosing some of these words got them more points than others. So basket might give you 10 points, football might give you zero, zero points, and you would learn this as you continued to choose between the pairs of words, and the more points you got, the more money you got. So you were pretty motivated to actually to, to figure out which words are valuable and to, and to learn all of the words. And there are 14 different words in total that they, could have, that they learned across the training phase of the experiment. Okay, so then we said, Thanks, thanks for learning those words. That's what we gave you the points to, to help you learn them. So you can just forget about how much points, how many points there are worth in, in the first part of the experiment. Now, now that you've learned them, we want you to use those words to solve new puzzles. And the puzzles would look something like this. So they'd be told, okay, so out of the words that you saw in part one, give us the word with the most straight vertical lines in its letters. Um, so for example, H and M and N would all have two straight vertical lines, um, but letters like O, and W or U would have none. And you, so you get 10 points for each vertical line in the, in, um, in the letters of the word that you choose. But you're given a limited amount of time to do it. So you're given 30 seconds to answer this question. There are 14 words in total. You have a little virtual notepad and you have to answer your answer. So if you think about the problem that participants are facing, it's kind of like the problem of getting to the airport in a way, right? It's, it's a very small, sort of simple example of that kind of problem. There are too many words to actually consider with the amount of time you have. You, You've learned from the past that some of these words are, are were just good solutions for a separate problem, um, and but you only have time to consider a subset of them. So the thought is, well, maybe the part of the subset of the, the what was partly going to drive which words they even consider in the very first place is going to be the previously experienced value, so from part one, right? even though that's irrelevant in this particular example. And then maybe if those are the words that you actually even consider in the first place, the ones you evaluate, then you're going to, of that subset of words, you're going to select the one from that subset that have the most vertical lines in it. So what's nice about doing um, this kind of experiment, where you have a much, much more constrained space, and it's a, it's a well-defined space, right? So we know all the words participants have seen. We know how many vertical letters are in each of them. We know what the best answer is. <laughs> we know we have an exact history of all of the rewards they've gotten for every single word. So we can actually build a model which says, okay, suppose that this was the underlying process that participants were using. They considered a subset of words based purely on the, on the previous value of the words, and then within that subset of words, they sampled or they um, evaluated each one for how many straight vertical lines in it. So what's the probability that they'll give the answer that they gave under that model, if that was the process they were using? And then we can compare it to different models, right? So we can compare it to a model where just participants didn't care about this experiment at all and just were choosing random. So that would just say there's a uniform distribution over choosing any given word. Or other models. So say participants are um, doing this task perfectly. So they actually took every single word, they counted all the vertical lines in all of them, what's the probability that they would, uh, they would give the answers they gave if they were using that model? And we had a bunch of different ones. 
So the key thing is here is now we can compare all these models and ask, well, which one is most likely to have actually done the process the participants were using when giving the answers that they, they gave? And what you see is it's this one. So it's a, it's a model on which participants were only considering a subset of the words. Partly what determined that subset was how valuable those words had been in the past. Um, and, and in addition, it was basically how good those words were to work to the problem that they currently faced. About 70% of people were, seemed to be using this model. Um, about 20% of people seemed to be estimated to use a model in which um, the words that had a particularly low value in the previous experiment were actually more likely to be considered. And one way of understanding that is just that the really, really low value words were going to be more salient um, than some of the high value words. OK, so what I tried to argue was that maybe if you start thinking about decision making, um, this is a context in which um, you can make sense of why value might constrain the default possibilities that we consider, right? But uh, what I want to, I haven't really done is actually show that connection directly. So in this final, final very quick experiment, what I want to do is try to argue for that direct connection, and it's, I think it's kind of fun and it was a little surprising for us. So here's what we did: we went back to the same kind of task where you're choosing between different words. You learn that different words have value, but in this case, there are certain words that are grayed out, and what that means is you can't actually click on them. So you can try, you can try to click on helicopter, but it's just not going to actually let you to do it, let you do it. But you can click on football, so words that work right out. Um, but once again, you still know you have to learn the value of each of these different words. Okay, so now instead of answering these complicated problems, we asked them to answer a really, a really simple problem, which was, was it possible to select this particular word in stage one? And we had a bunch of different words. So some of them were high value words like basket. Some of them were words that had been grayed out like helicopter. In our example, some of them were words that actually just never occurred, so alligator, which you definitely couldn't have clicked on. Um, and some of them were low value words, and those are the ones we were most interested in. OK, so now this graph should again look kind of familiar. What I'm going to do is for each category of words, so high value words, grayed out words, absent words, and low value words, we're going to plot the percentage of, of words that were judged to be impossible, both when participants hand, had to answer that quickly and when they had to answer that slowly. So what you see is that um, high value words, there wasn't a, there was a, a small difference um, where they were, but not the overall they were judged to be very possible to select. Um, grayed out words overall were not judged to be possible to select, um, and that really didn't differ if you're answering quickly or slowly. Absent words were definitely not possible to be selected, and that didn't matter whether you're answering quickly or slowly. And low value ones, the key idea here is you see the pattern that we predicted, right? So low value words, people were actually judging that it wasn't possible to select low value words when they're answering quickly, and that totally disappeared when they had time to reflect before answering, um, which I thought was a pretty surprising and, and, and cool result, which I think helps to sort of directly connect the, the role that um, default representations of possibilities, so which options we're even considering in the first place, um, the role that might play in decision making. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Amazing stuff, as always. Well, uh, let's go how... Uh, I, I think Ivar is typing something. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I have a, a, a minor question about uh, your slide. I think it's 66. It's, it's, uh, I, I would love uh, to hear a little more about your alternative proposal to to Kratzer, uh, semantical analysis in terms of uh, yeah. model base and ordering source. Uh, it's not clear at all to yeah. me how your proposal works in that case. Okay, <laughs> if you uh, feel free to to, yeah. to 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 enlighten me about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the the basic way that we're thinking about it is that um, I mean, there's a high level description, and then there's like a very Sort of technical description, and I'm not sure. I mean, it, uh, the I, I, I know I know a little about Kratzer, you... but okay. Well, so the, I, let's well, let's at least start with the high level description. So the basic idea is that um, what you're going to do is you're going to have um, a situation anchor. So if you say like uh, you know uh, John could rob a bank, so there's in the situation anchor there's John robbing a bank. And then we're going to take that situation and we're going to project from that situation a set of, a set of counterpart situations. Mm -hmm. So these are the situations in which involve John and 
and this is a similar situation that John's in, right? And we're going to ask amongst those counterparts to the, situ the anchor situation, so John in the situation we're in, or do any of those counterparts involve John robbing a bank? And now the key high-level idea um, is that the domain projection that we're doing is defaults to being constrained both by the, the descriptive facts of the situation, but also by prescriptive values. So we only consider, one way of thinking about it is we only tend to consider good counterparts. So that's the, that's the kind of default way. So we say, someone says John could rob a bank, you know, when he needs to, say, pay his, pay his bills. The, the idea is normally we would judge that to be false. The reason we would judge that to be false is because amongst the counterparts that we're considering to that situation, the one involving John needing to pay his rent, none of those are ones in which he's he's actually robbing a bank. Um, now the key puzzle is, well, so then how is it that it's for some modals, say like modals like might, right, say there's a high probability of John robbing a bank or has some evidence that he might rob a bank but it's not perfect, um, how is it that we get the counterparts? And so the, the, the idea here, right, is that part of the lexical information that might encodes is just to try to, to shift away from the default form of domain projection to one where uh, prescriptive values don't actually matter. So that's, that's the high-level way of thinking about it. Okay, okay. Well, uh, Ivar is asking for a minute to, to do her question, I think. His question. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's typing. Well, okay. here we are. Uh, Thanks, Yvar. Um, should I read the question out, or can everyone see it? Okay. Uh, so, what do you make of the division between participants who tended to select high value versus low value word means? Um, what does it mean that a minority? I think you said twenty fifth. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I totally understand the question. So, the que I think um, the way that I take the question is the whole proposal that I've been giving was um, that. Uh, the kinds of words that you would even consider that would come to mind immediately be words that have in the past had a high value. So isn't it just like totally insane that there was some percentage of participants, like 20% of participants, they were more likely to consider words that had a low value. Doesn't that just like totally go against the whole kind of way that I was thinking about this? Um, and I think that's a great question. Uh, the way that I would think about it is that which words you consider, or in general, even for d more general default representations of possibility, m value isn't going to be the only thing that plays a role. So saliency, just general saliency, or frequency of having seen something, is also going to play a role. So in another set of studies I didn't present with the w doing with the words again, you can just manipulate the number of times, say, a participant has seen a word, and that also will influence whether or not they consider that word. Um, and then we'll evaluate how many vertical lines are in it. So my guess is that's what's happening with that subset of participants. Are there ones where they're trying to solve the task by basically avoiding low value words? So they're paying a lot of attention to words that have a particularly low value. And then above that, they don't really care. They just want to get some points. Um, so those people who are paying a lot of attention to those words would then be more likely to consider them. And then because of, because of that, they're judging them to be possible. Yeah, that's, that's the basic idea. I don't know if that makes sense so far. Well, how how long it, it will it will take to to see these results with Bloom published? The ones with Paul Bloom, the ones with the kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. You know, the review process is is long and arduous for developmental psychology. Um, so the I, the the real answer is that. Uh, so there is a p paper that's published, the one with Andrew Stuhlman which basically replicates the stuff that I've done with Paul okay. um, and extends on it. So if you're looking for a published version of that effect, you'll, you can see it in the paper um, with Andrew Stuhlman. If you're looking for like the longer paper uh, that has more of this sort of theoretical picture behind why this would be the case and what's going on like developmentally, like what's changing across development, um, I hope that that paper will come out in, by the end of the summer. But uh, it's hard to it's okay. hard to know with these things. Okay, okay. Well, well, I, I think we are running out of time. I uh, I'd like to thank you again, uh, Jonathan, and invite yeah. you to to stay online to watch the the presentation from Paolo from Belfast. Okay, and thank you, thank okay, you again. It's great. It's great yeah, to have you, you here. Yeah. Thanks. For, thanks for inviting me again. <laughs>
Okay, thank you.